roadside IEDs were very common in Iraq. They were almost part of our daily lives. <laughs> you know, we wake up, eat breakfast, and then go defuse roadside IEDs. My name is Jay Dorlius, and I was a first sergeant in the United States Army. Well, I spent two separate deployments to Iraq. I was mainly doing route clearance, looking for IEDs, and also disposing of IEDs. Today, we're going to look at Iraq war battles from movies and TV shows and judge how real they are. Right, so the formation that they're using right here to uh, patrol through the city is not one that I recommend nor have I ever seen done downrange because what you have here is just a cluster of people just walking down the street and all it takes is a grenade or an RPG to uh, be fired at them and they would take multiple casualties when in reality what they should be doing is either push the vehicles ahead of them or push the vehicles behind them and then between the personnel themselves, they should have at least five meters standoff in between them. If I have any suspicion that a vehicle-borne IED is coming towards me, the first thing I'm gonna do is take cover because when it does go off, shrapnel's gonna go everywhere. If you're just standing on the road like these guys were, you're probably gonna get hit by something. They were essentially in a line firing out the car and then Chris Kyle is firing from above, they're in his line of fire, right? So a lot could have gone wrong with just them standing in the road like that. In reality, what they should have done was get behind cover and then engaging the car. And then for as many time as they engaged it, they should have hit the driver. <laughs> Suicide bombers uh, were a common threat in Iraq because it's one of the uh, tools that they found was very effective. Uh, and it's harder for us to detect and defeat because you literally have a moving bomb heading towards you. In the streets of Iraq, at any given time, you have you know hundreds of cars just parked there. That's one technique that they would use also is they would you know, pack the cars with bombs and just um, leave them sitting on the side of the roads where they know we typically go out on patrols. And then once we go by it, they set it off. What I've experienced in Iraq Typically, when they put uh, bombs in the cars, the bottom of it is sagging because that's where all the load is. So that's something that we look out for, but it didn't have any of the signs that I typically see uh, downrange. Calling in. This is real two problem. Requesting ordinance drop. Grid number zero, fire away. So typically, when you call in an airstrike, uh, things are going bad. Like, you really need rounds on target right away or else you're gonna be dead. The way that was portrayed is also not accurate, right? Because Chris Kyle wouldn't have the authority to just say, hey, put rounds on target, right? That's a ground force commander's decision, mainly because once you release that round, like, you're owning it. Target missed. There's a lot of things that plays into account as for why they missed it. Sandstorm is probably the main reason. And when it comes to putting rounds on the objective, with a sandstorm like this, they probably weren't able to properly laser their target because the aircraft itself has certain uh, lasers on it that they can use to actually pinpoint where the round's supposed to go. So the sandstorm could have threw the laser off to where it wasn't properly laser or didn't have clear uh, visual of it. Between Chris Kyle and his sniper buddy, somebody should have what we call an islet on their person to where they can mark where they want the rounds to go. Sandstorm do happen pretty frequently, especially during the summer. Typically, once the sandstorm comes around, everybody's hunkered down because you can't see anything. You gotta know where your rounds are going at all times. So if we can't clearly identify where the rounds are going, then yeah, we're not shooting at anybody. We'll probably just hunker down and wait for it to pass. I would give American Sniper a five out of 10 mainly because of the realism with the uh, VBIED and then also the technique that these guys use as they were patrolling just didn't make any sense. So that's what we call indirect fire, meaning the enemy is anywhere from two to 300 meters away and they are launching mortar rounds either uh, 60s or 81 millimeter mortars towards uh, the convoy. It's a tactic that the enemy um, used a lot because they set up the IED 
And then once it goes off, it disables the convoy, the convoy being all the vehicles that are moving through, and then they're able to lob mortars and cause additional damage. Go! Move right, cover right, go! Having a turret system which allows you to maneuver a gun or shift the gun from left to right uh, is beneficial because it allows you to you know, transition from covering uh, your element as it moves He either hit a landmine, and the landmine had to be, you know, situated just right to hit, you know, around the fuel tank for it to cause that big of a fireball. But in this situation right here, the only thing I could think of is, you know, he ran over a landmine. A landmines were very common to find in Iraq. And one of my first missions was actually low crawling to a landmine and going through my procedures as a 12 Bravo to uh, dispose of it. Uh, and it's all leftover munitions from like previous conflict that that country has been part of. So they're digging fighting positions, right? Fighting, pos especially in the open terrain like this, digging that hole gives them the ability to lay down and essentially uh, hide from the enemy. It gives them cover, right? And all they gotta do then is just pop up and then engage the enemy while their body is, is still concealed. I would give this a seven. The sniper! Hit hey, sir! Front. Where is it? He's right up there! Take it down the alley! That actually happens a lot. Iraq is a lot more urbanized than Afghanistan. You won't typically find snipers just laid out on the ground, right? As opposed to urban area, they have buildings, they have, you know, stores. They have a bunch of different places that they can hide. But, Typically, you won't notice a sniper or find a sniper unless he wants you to know that he's there. So as soon as he cracks off that first shot, then that's when you'll know, hey, we have a sniper on our hand. And by then, somebody's already hit. I want you to stay right on the backs of your shooters, all right? They will take you in. So he's talking about a stack. So a stack is, you know, like a group of four guys. Um, and they typically go and they clear a building. So if he's telling them to stay on the back of his shooters, then he wants them right behind either the number one, two, three, or four man, and then he'll just go into the building with them. Personally, when I'm conducting CQB, I don't want anybody touching me or all on my back. I'd rather go in, clear the building first, and let you know, hey, it's clear, you could come in. This is no WMD site. There's never been any evidence found that Iraq actually had WMDs. So the whole um, WMD, uh, debacle, I'll say, uh, that caused us to go into Iraq. Uh, you know, I remember in 2003, I was actually around uh, Hadith Dam, which was one of the places that uh, we thought uh, WMDs were being stored. And it's, it's disappointing to later on find out that it, it, it didn't exist, right? So we essentially went in under false pretenses, you know, lost a bunch of soldiers. I lost some good friends. Uh, you know, for the cause that we thought was righteous and that ended up not being the case. I would give this a four out of 10, mainly because of how they handle the sniper. Everyone was out in the open with a sniper on the loose. He could have easily just, you know, picked everyone off before they even made it to the building where the sniper was actually hiding. And when he says control your fires, that just means, hey, don't shoot all your ammunition at once. Make sure you choose a string of fire that makes sense, right? Typically, a basic combat load for a soldier is 210 rounds, right? That's what we carry on our person whenever we go out on missions. So that's seven magazines. You don't want to run out of ammunition. It happened to me a couple of times. You know, eight to 10 hour battles, you're gonna run out of ammunition. What we teach uh, soldiers is to make sure the guns talk, right? So you want the guns to talk, meaning, I fire three rounds, I stop, he fires three rounds, right? And then it just goes down the line. So, and then we repeat. We all don't want to stop firing at once, right? So we want to take turns. This is probably the most accurate, uh, you know, scene I've seen as far as gun battles. There's a lot of standoff and they're just engaging rounds back and forth. That's your typical engagement in Iraq during the time period that I was there. What you saw there was an AT4. Um, it is a common issue items for infantry guys, and it, it was used properly too. You wanna make sure you have standoff. That's getting them away from the wall so they have enough clearing for the rounds to go off. 
All right, and then before they fire it, they check their back blast, make sure nobody's behind them. That is a accurate depiction of what happens if you're triggered by PTSD. My PTSD took on the form of anger. So I was, you know, going, you know, out drinking and I was getting into a lot of bar fights. You know, cops would go to arrest my buddy. I would jump on the cop and next thing you know, I'm in handcuffs. So I had to seek help to, um, I guess, get me in the right state of mind, right? To refocus my state of mind. And that help came in the form of me getting thrown in a jail. But it worked, because 20 years later, here I am. 12 o'clock, what do you see? Beyonce, Destiny's child, dude, right in front of you. He doesn't really know where he's at. So his buddies had to uh, calm him down and then refocus him. You're not on the battlefield anymore, right? So that is a pretty accurate depiction. Different people uh, requires different things. In this particular situation, that's what that guy needed, right? But every soldier is different and your fellow soldiers will know exactly how to bring you back. I would rate this a nine out of 10 because they do a really good job at the uh, rooftop battle scene and also depicting what actually happens when you have a PTSD episode. Got that? Yeah. There we go. During the beginning of the war, we started to incorporate robots. This one specifically is what we call a Talon, right? And the whole premise behind it was to limit soldiers actually getting injured. Because prior to, we were using mine detectors and going up and looking for IEDs in that manner. And guys were getting injured left and right. Uh, so it was uh, a lifesaver. Good to go. All right, wagon set up, bot moves. <laughs> Wagons having a bad day, boys. So I've never had one of those, um, nor have I ever used one of those before. And for that exact reason, it doesn't really travel well over terrain. Um, in Iraq, the terrain is, is rarely even. And it was time to go put, you know, charge on whatever device that we were going to put the charges on. We just built a little handle on the actual charge and it went on the claw. And that's how we were able to put the charge on the actual bomb not on the wagon like they used in the clip here. Brown of Eldridge! I can't get a shot! <laughs> when you start talking about IEDs, you have two separate ways that they can be initiated. You have victim initiated, which is pressure plate or command debt wire, and then you have remote control, which in this case, it was remote control. We do have devices that are supposed to mitigate them being able to uh, remotely activate the IEDs. We call them jammers. It's like a big antenna that sends out all these different signals, and if it doesn't recognize the signal, it jams the frequency to where it can't get to the IED. It can't close the loop. So I would give this one a four. Just the realism of him actually going up and putting the charge on the IED wasn't accurate at all. Bastard! Bastard! We'll lose your pad! We'll lose your pad! Triangle of Death was a incredibly dangerous area that was located south of Baghdad. Fallujah was one of those places. Um, I actually spent some time there in 2004, and the IED threat and also the insurgent threat um, down there was ridiculous. All of Saddam's uh, uh, loyal uh, fighters were all around that area, and they were very experienced. We had a bunch of different units responsible for doing different things. For example, we knew there was an IED threat. So we enlisted, you know, combat engineers like myself to go clear the routes. And then we also had infantry guys going out on patrols every morning and the evening to deter the enemy from actually coming out. There weren't people necessarily behind us, chasing us and firing at us. It was coming from the sides, right? So they would set up ambushes and as vehicles are driving down the road, they would engage them through that manner. I would rate this a five out of 10. How the highway chase scene was depicted, that's not something that those guys do. And if they did, these guys would not have made it out of there. <laughs> Roadside IEDs were very common in Iraq. They were almost part of our daily lives. <laughs> you know, we wake up, eat breakfast, and then go defuse roadside IEDs. So they would place these IEDs in a variety of places. Um, and as the war progressed, their techniques got more and more complicated because as we discover a technique that they were using, they adjust and they found another way. It was like playing chess, 
Um, so they started off placing them on the side of the roads. Uh, then they realized that we found a way to easily detect them on the side of the road. Then they started putting them in the middle of the roads and potholes um, and puddles of water. Uh, once we found out how to defuse those, then they started to put them in coverts to where we couldn't even see them. Based on what I saw in this scene, this ID was on the side of the road. Because when the ID went off, it pushed the vehicle and it flipped it a couple of times. If it was in the middle of the road, it would have pushed the vehicle up and essentially just um, disintegrated. This IED was probably triggered using what we like to call command detonation. So in a desert situation like this, you need an aiming point. So you as the bad guy could have enough standoff and you know when to send it off, right? So as the vehicle comes, let's say I'm using a pole. As the first vehicle travels down the road, as soon as it hits that aiming point, which is a pole, then I know to set it off. They had command wire probably um, unraveled, and then once they saw the vehicle hit the aiming point, they pulled the igniter, and that's how they were able to set it off. You can literally see the wire if you're trained to look for it. And a lot of these units would have issues because they didn't have the trained eye that a combat engineer would where we went to school to learn how to look for these things, right? They would just drive down the road and then get blown up. I would give this a seven out of 10. The IED scene was on point. They could have done a lot better job at uh, the follow through after the IED went off. Hey guys, just check it the oh! Just looking at um, the scene itself with him just standing out in the open, Cavalo is not properly secured. Uh, there's, there's just a lot wrong with it right off the bat. His chin strap is supposed to be buckled and he it, it was just dangling. Um, it's supposed to be buckled and fastened to where if he does have to run, it's not falling off. Oh, get away from me, man. No! I understand what he was doing there, but there's a more efficient way he could have done that. And that's to just get down and just low crawl. He had enough uh, cover, he could have easily just got behind or in some of those brushes and kind of made his way to John Cena that way. You're running the zigzag pattern. All he has to do is anticipate where you're gonna be next and he ambushes you and he shoots you right then and there. Uh, so no, that's not accurate at all as far as how that could have been done. It's hard to identify a sniper in a setting like this, especially if he's trained, he's just gonna lay down you know, he can be a thousand meters away, like you're not finding him, right? So you either get um, air support overhead or you just spray the area with, um, with rounds and hope for the best. But there really isn't a good way to identify a sniper from the road, right? Especially if he's that far away. Once he shoots, you'll see dust kick off if he's not properly concealed. As soldiers, they teach us self-aid. Meaning, if I get hit in the leg, it's my job to take care of this wound, all right? So that's what he should have been doing. Instead of flawing on the ground, all dramatic, he should have went to work and dressed his wound. There's a Humvee right there. So he could have crawled to that Humvee um, out of sight, out of mind of that sniper. There's absolutely no reason why his buddy, you know, had to make the mad dash. I would rate this a four out of 10. None of it made sense to me at all. Uh, so this clip depicts the uh, Battle of Nazaria uh, when the United States uh, Marines were pushing north towards Baghdad and they got ambushed. And this is significant because it ended up turning into a uh, two weeks uh, long engagement with the insurgents. Fighting along the river banks in Iraq is something that happened a lot. Some of the advantage would be uh, just cover, right? Because you have all the vegetation there. Uh, so you're able to mask yourself from enemy fire a lot better, but you also got to figure too, whatever uh, advantages we have, they also have because they also have cover on the other side, right? Um, the one thing they didn't have were those Humvees with 50 cows on top of them and the gunners being able to see uh, above that vegetation. So part of what we would do as um, uh, guys conducting rock clearances, we, we would search for what we call weapons cache. Weapons cache means um, we're looking for weapons that have been buried. What they do is they take all the weapons and all the munitions that they have and they go bury them. 
So what we would then do as engineers is we would pull out our mine detectors and we would go look for them. And they would, they always like burying them around the riverbed. So when we would go dig them up, they would engage us from across the river. The whole battalion is two clicks east of us on the other side of the Garaf Canal. It is possible for a company to take a wrong turn and get lost in Iraq. You got to keep in mind that we don't know the terrain. We have what's called Blue Force trackers. That's the screen that he was looking at. And it's supposed to tell you where on the map you are. And those things break a lot. It happened to a convoy that I was in. We were uh, able to call ahead and let the element know that, hey, we got separated. We need you guys to stop until we're able to catch up. And they did just that. We hate America, man. I said we call in some air, some cobras them up. There is no air. They seem to uh, distrust this particular interpreter because he is not just translating, he's also inputting his two cents into what the soldiers should be doing. And that's not what he's there for. He's there to just relay the message coming from us as soldiers to the local population. I would rate this scene from Generation Kill a nine out of 10. What they should have done immediately was get into those buildings and get on the rooftops because that's where the fight is being fought. Them staying uh, in the corridor right there gives the insurgency fire superiority and they're just fishing a bucket essentially, right? Just firing down on them. I was in Tikrit from 2007 to 2008. That's when I spent my 15 month deployment. And the city is correctly depicted here with the tight corridors, uh, the rooftops, and every day it was a battle in that place. It took some really uh, heavy fighting to finally get that place under control. It was Saddam's uh, hometown. So the uh, folks there were a lot more loyal to Saddam. That intensified uh, the firefights that would take place in that town. Like they did not want to go down easy. So that's what made it very different um, in my eyes. So in situations where um, Humvees get blown up, unless they're all gone, uh, then we'll just, you know, hunker down and call for support from base camp because we can't just leave them on the side of the road. We can't take off on foot because now we're leaving government equipment behind and we're running from the enemy and we just don't do that. Steve, don't go in there! We had a guy run into a building by himself um, with no battle buddy with him to cover his back. It takes two people to properly clear a room. If, as soon as I go left, my buddy needs to go right. Because if I go left and nobody goes right, who's to say that's not a guy right that'll shoot me in the back? I would rate this a five out of 10. The tactics used in this clip didn't make any sense. My favorite clip that I watched today was from Billy Lynn. And it's because of the rooftop firefight and how accurate it was. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, why not click on the next one?